tonight as far as teaching and preaching. Uh, we will be going to the book of Joshua, chapter 3. And the reason that is, is I, I'm, I'm so inclined to pick up where I left off this morning, but I, I believe God would have me to do that next week, next Sunday morning. And the, the Lord is just really speaking to me right now about something. And he's really showing me a move of God. And quite honestly, I've never in all of my days seen so clearly a move of God in my spirit. I've never seen so clearly, so precisely in my spirit, God showing me a move of his spirit. I've never so clearly and so precisely seen it to where the Lord showed me very specifically what River of Life's part is in. But he's just showing that to me so, so plainly. And so, and it, it really began a little bit before I went into Second Chronicles chapter 20 and began to dig into that. And then I began to study a little bit about Jehoshaphat, and when I did, it just exploded in me. There's one particular chapter about Jehoshaphat that the Lord just gave me tremendous rhema about this. And so it's exploded inside of me, but tonight's not tonight. And that's not funny. <laughs> the Lord's got a sense of humor about that. But I mean, it is just exploding inside of me. It is we're praying, we're worshiping. It's just every, every time I begin to worship the Lord, every time I begin to pray, God is showing me this move. And God is just exploding me inside of me about it. And so, one of the things that I really probably may sound a little urgent about is, is trying to get your attention about this, beloved. It's time to see God. And, and I'm not talking, and, I, and, 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 I, and I'm not talking about religious stuff. We say, praise God, woo, 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 because we're in church, and we know that's what we're supposed to say. I'm talking about a life-changing moment where we let go of the things of the world and seek God with all of our heart, because there's a move of God ready to be birthed right here, right now, and we, that is our part. Amen. That's our part. That's our part. That's our part. Not somebody else's part. That's our part. River of life's part. Let me be more specific. The folks who are sitting in the chairs right now. That's our part. And that's God's call. And God's speaking to me so very plainly about this. Beloved, there, there, praise God. I mean, there is a city shaking, central Illinois shaking move of God ready to break loose right now. Right now, I'm telling you, I see that in my spirit so plainly, so clearly. I've never seen anything in the spirit as clearly as I see that right now. But trust me, God began to speak to me. First and foremost about this, beloved. And you know what, Pastor Mike? It's time. It's time. He began to speak to me about this a little while back. It's time that revival you've been talking about. It's time that revival you've been praying about. It's time that revival you've been believing God for. It's time. This time, this time, but it involves us laying some stuff down and seeking God. It involves us changing some things in our life as a church. Not just as individuals, I'm talking about as a church. That we become a church, that it would be said of us that they seek the Lord in all things. There were things that happened in Jehoshaphat's life as a result of that. That God is showing me the parallels between that and River of Life as a church. Hallelujah. We ain't going to preach about that tonight. <laughs> That's next Sunday. To us, a bad Sunday. But I'm just saying that because it's just so, it, it is so strong on my heart right now. It, it's just not another sermon. It's just not another service, beloved. If I know anything, I'm speaking to you about the Lord tonight. And I'm telling you, focus. Focus your heart and focus your life and seek God. And if there's silliness going on that hinders that walk, then you get rid of it. Because it's time. 
It's time. And, and, I, and I know this much, that revival does one of two things. It either sets you on fire or pushes you away. One of the two things revival does. There's a revival move in the spirit right now just being confirmed. I, I mean, I can just see it so plainly in my spirit. Every time I pray, every time I worship, I can see it so clearly in my spirit. And it's coming as a result of a church that seeks God. And I want you to hear that. It's coming as a result of a church that seeks God. Not as a result of a church that has services the results of a church that seeks God. You understand the difference? Mm -hmm. I mean, we can come in here and have church service. And we can come in here and have a church service that, oh boy, and it may be even a good church service. But it's not coming as a result of a church that has a good service. It's coming as a result of a body of people who, have, who make a decision in their heart to seek God. Not just in services, but as a way of life. coming as a result of a pastor who seeks God in every area of his life. Is anybody here the Holy Ghost? <laughs> is it just me? If I see that in your spirit, I see that so plainly, so clearly. And the other, the other day when I was just going to prepare to teach on 2 Chronicles chapter 20, I read some stuff about Jehoshaphat, and I mean, I just had a Holy Ghost explosion of revelation in me about that. So we're going to study something tonight that kind of related. Um, that's going to be the thing. But the one thing we've got to understand, and that I'm going to tap, touch upon tonight, is that God is the source of increase. 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 And, and I want to just talk about that for a moment, and we're going to get to some verses here in Joshua chapter 3, and, and just a little bit here. But I want, to, I want us to focus on something real quick. And, and this ties right in with seeking God. Because if we're truly going to seek God, we've got to understand who our source is. Amen? Because we're going to go to the source. We're going to go to what we think is the source. And like some of the, the things I was sharing this morning about, you know, we're going to turn to where we trust in times of trouble. And just like the Jehoshaphat, when the multitudes came against him, they turned to their place of trust. Jehoshaphat turned to God, and he began to seek God. He began to pray, and he began to fast, and he gathered them together, and they corporately began to seek God. They turned to where they trusted. And if we truly understand that God is the source of increase in every area of our life, then we're going to be more inclined to turn to him, aren't we? I mean, you remember the account that, that talks about the, when the 12 spies went into the promised land? I mean, that's one of the great examples of that. When the 12 spies went into the promised land and, and they, you know, they had heard God promised them it's a land of milk and honey and so on and so forth. And they went in and spied out the land and they said, wow, yeah, it really is awesome. It really is great. Look at how big the, the vegetables are. Look at how big the fruit is. It's truly a glorious land, but you don't understand. Look at this. Look at the enemies here. The Amalekites are here and so on and so forth. And they went down a list of all the reasons they couldn't take that land. And they came back and they, they gave their report. And you know that Chen gave an evil report. They said, you know, we're just like grasshoppers in those people's sight. We're just like grasshoppers. There's nothing we can do. And so the, the other two, Josh, 
if God is the source of increase, then we're going to turn with our heart and we're going to turn to Him and delight Him and delight Him and praise Him and worship Him and begin to pursue to please Him. Because we realize something. He's our source. You hear me talk about all the time about uh, Asa, King Asa. And, and again, Asa was somebody that was had touched upon the idea of trusting God. Had touched upon the idea, idea of seeking God. And he was a, a, a king that there was times in his life when he sought God and he seen tremendous victories. But there's times when he didn't seek God and saw great defeat. And we know that he turned in, I believe he entered into a covenant, I think it was the king of Syria, and as he entered into covenant with him, and you know, we're going to fight each other's battles, and when any enemies come against us, we're going to rely on each other. And the enemy came against him and attacked him, and immediately they were defeated. Why? Because God didn't send the prophet to him. Explain why. Because you have taken your trust out of God and put your trust into this worldly king. Because of that, you are defeated. When you placed your trust in God, you saw victory. But then later on in his life, he got a foot disease. It says he didn't seek God. And because he didn't seek God, he died. Asa apparently never learned the lesson that that prophet brought to him that day. That prophet came to him with a very direct, very specific message. When you trust God, you see victory. When you don't trust God, you see defeat. Asa apparently never learned that lesson. But I personally believe his son learned a lot by watching Asa. Do you know who Asa's son was? Jehoshaphat. And he learned a lot about trusting God. And he learned a lot about seeking God. Beloved, if we truly trust God as the source of our victory, then we're going to seek God. Then we're going to pursue God. And then in time of trouble, the first thing we're going to do is to call out to God and truly seek Him. You know, that's one of the things that for years I, I really struggled with it, and I used to really battle a lot, a lot of torment about financial matters years ago, especially in my, in my early 30s. And I just, uh, you know, I, I was just learning to trust God and just learning to walk with God in so many areas. And, and that was really the area where I struggled to trust God, was areas of finances. And there was a period of time that I went through tremendous torment about that. I mean, I would toss and turn at night. I'd wake up. I couldn't sleep. I'd wake up in the middle of the night trying to figure out money and, and this bill and that bill and this money's coming in and that money's coming in and trying to do all of this stuff in my head. I'd be driving to work. I had a job then where I drove a lot of miles across the state of Illinois selling security systems and, and just a lot of time on the road and I'd just be tired all the time. And I took Philippians 4.19 and I turned it into a song and I used to sing it. And every time anything would come against me and try to torment me with the financial matter, I would sing Philippians 4.19. I won't sing it for you, but the verse says, My God shall supply all of my needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. And every time the enemy would come against me and attack me, I would begin to praise God by singing that chorus to him and singing that verse to him and begin to praise him for the financial victories in my life. And that was my way of trusting him and delighting myself in him as the attack and the battle came against me. And beloved, I would see victory and the peace of God would come on the scene every single time. The enemy would come again, what would I do? I'd sing it again. The enemy would come again, I'd sing it again. And he, and he, he eventually quit coming and bothered me, trying to torment me like that. I never did figure out whether I got victory or whether he just got tired of my singing, but he quit bothering me either way. <laughs> But I delighted myself in the Lord. I put myself in a place to praise Him. I put myself in a place to worship Him. I put myself in a place to declare Him as my victory. My God shall supply all of my needs according to His riches and glory in Christ Jesus. God is the source of every victory. God is the source of every increase. You know, and I started off a few months ago by talking to us about taking our services to the next level. To the next level. Well, God is the source of that. I'm talking about a move of God. God is the source of that. I'm talking about God doing miraculous things. God is the source of that. I'm talking about what God is showing me in my spirit. God is the source of that, beloved. He's a God of victory. He's a God of increase. 
Ha lu ya. Who's the source of our righteousness? Yeah. Let me show you that. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5.
series that we overcome, doesn't it? So I can probably give a Bible quiz at a lot of churches and say, how do you overcome? And you know what? A lot of Christians would probably flunk that. They'd probably write down all kinds of goofy ideas. How do you overcome? How do you become an overcomer? We better find out because all these promises like being written in the Lamb's Book of Life is only for overcomers. So we better know who an overcomer is. We better know how we overcome, shouldn't we? I mean, you would think by now all those Bible scholars would have that down pretty good. How in the world do we overcome? Everybody looking at me like, you better tell us, Pastor, I'm getting nervous. <laughs> it's funny. The Bible always interprets the Bible. And the Bible always explains the Bible. And that's one of the most basic principles of Bible study that people miss all the time. I mean, they come to the book of Revelation and they think it's so mysterious. Everything in the book of Revelation is interpreted in the Bible. Everything in the book of Revelation is explained in the Bible. And it goes through all that stretch there, tells us all these glorious promises to the overcomer, and we can stop right there and be left out in the cold and say, well, we can come up with all these man-made ideas of how we overcome. Well, how do you overcome? Well, I don't know. You've got to memorize 13 verses a day. And then you've got to recite them in front of the church every Sunday. And you've got to be baptized and take communion 27 times. How do you overcome? You've got to attend church for at least three times a week, and you've got to do that faithfully for 137 years. How do you overcome? You've got to have the coat touch you on the head. How do you overcome? <laughs> Revelation chapter 12 tells us all about it. It's very simple, actually. It's funny how the Bible interprets the Bible. And it tells us an overcomer is. And everybody says, well, I do that. <laughs> Revelation chapter 12, verse 11 says, And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto death. How do we overcome the same way the Israelites overcame the death angel in the book of Exodus chapter 12, when they put the blood above the door? How do we overcome the same way those did, those Israelites did, when those serpents bit them, and they looked upon the, the serpent held up on the pole by Moses, and they were healed instantly? How do we overcome the same way Jesus told Nicodemus to be overcome? He said, you must be born again. Nicodemus says, how in the world do you do that? He said, now, if I be lifted up the way Moses would lift it up the serpent, he said, that's how you do it. He said, if I be lifted up, all men shall come unto me. That's how you do it. You can become an overcomer by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. If there's any one thing the body of Christ and the church ought to know, it ought to be how to overcome by the blood of the Lamb. Yeah. We ought to at least have that now, don't you think? That ought to be automatic today. How do you overcome by the blood of Jesus Christ? By the power of the blood. There's victory in the blood of the Lamb. That ought to be on the hand of our mother. Boom, just instantly. Because yeah. then we look at that and we think, oh, how do we overcome? What's it talking about? That's a book of Revelation. It must be mysterious. <laughs> by the blood of the Lamb. You see, there was a great move of God before Jesus came, the first time. John the Baptist was a tremendous revivalist. He went out and had open-air crusades. I don't know if he had a tent or not, but he had what we would call tent meetings. And he preached to people. And people came out in the multitudes to hear him. And they came in the multitudes to come to a place of repentance. And God said that John the Baptist was a man who was preparing the way of the Lord. And how he prepared the way of the Lord and that revival he seen was he called people to repentance and he brought to their attention the Lamb of God. And when Jesus came upon the scene, he pointed to him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And when he pointed and referred to him as the Lamb of God, they knew exactly what they were talking about. They were talking about that Lamb that was taken in and slaughtered in the blood Jesus Christ. 
God is the source. The blood of the Lamb is the means. How about 1 Corinthians chapter 3? First Corinthians chapter 3. Hallelujah! God is a source of victory. God is a source of increase. You know, we've been talking, and it has come up to me at various times. <coughs> uh, since we had the conference, and some of you have come to me and brought up the applied to, you know what, and Sue came up today and talked to me about today, you know, one of the messages we heard over and over and over was to go, to go, to go with the gospel, take it to the lost and dying people, take it to the lost and dying world, and then we're talking about that, we're preaching about that, and, and trust me, I've seen it in my spirit, I've seen a move of God, I want you to understand something, when I say that, I go, Ooh, Lord to God, I'm not just seeing people get dumped down, jumping down the shop in sanctuary, that's not what I'm seeing. We have that all the time. I'm seeing people out there getting set free. I'm seeing people out there bondage is being broken. I've seen people out there get filled up with the Holy Ghost. I've seen people out there coming to Jesus Christ. I've seen people out there coming to repentance and being set on fire by God. Why? Because there's a church that is seeking God. Because there's a church called River of Life and they're seeking God. And because they're seeking of God, the Spirit of God breaks loose. God is the source of increase. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6. Now this is 100% exactly what this is talking about. I'm not pulling something out of the sky, interpreting something out of context in any way, shape, or form. I had planned Apollos water, but God gave me increase. I have planted, said Paul. Apollos has watered, but God gave the increase. You see, he's talking about the church here. They've got all these battles going on. They're fighting in the church and who they want to preach and who they don't want to preach. And, and, and the understanding from what we know about Paul and the understanding of what we know from the history about Paul, and this sounds funny because Paul wasn't a very good preacher. <coughs> And that, that's historically recorded and what we know about Paul. Paul was not considered to be a good preacher. In other words, he's the kind of guy who would get up here and preach and everybody would say, oh, oh, boy. <laughs> oh, come on, Pastor. Don't let him preach again. I mean, he's a lovable guy. We like Paul, but please don't, don't let him preach again. And here's that Apollos. Apollos. <laughs> he was a man. Everybody loved to hear Apollos. Apollos was a man who was mighty in word. And could stand up and grab a hold of a congregation and hold your attention, tell funny stories probably, have all kinds of great illustrations and everybody loved to hear. And so they started a problem in the church. Who do you want to hear? Do you want to hear Apollos? Or do you want to hear Paul? Well, you know, Paul is kind of timid in speech, and he, you know, Paul's kind of hard to put up with, but, you know, he does have that anointing thing on him. You know, people get healed, and people get delivered, people get saved, and all that stuff, but, man, Paul sure is funny. And Paul's addressing the issue and saying, you know what? I just planted seeds. Now, Paul's came along, and he wandered those seeds a little bit. He took care of the plants for a little bit. But understand something, beloved. God gave the increase. It's not Paul. It's not Apollos. It's God that gives the increase. You see, beloved, when you share the gospel with somebody, you're planting a seed. And somebody else might come along and, and might water that seed a little bit. And somebody else might come along and pray for that individual a little bit and care for that individual and love for that individual. 
When that day comes, that person comes to Christ, God gave the increase. God may do it. Our part in a community is to plant seeds and water those seeds. We go out and we plant the seeds of the gospel in the hearts of men. And we begin to pray. And we begin to seek God. And those seeds begin to get watered by an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And then, boom, God gives the increase. God is the source of increase. God is the source of increase. You know, I, I've often used the story. Now, let's understand this principle a little bit. I, I, I've shared with you in my testimony about how when I was in Southern California for a period of time, there was just that season where people constantly came to me and witness to me. I mean, I couldn't walk down the street in California without somebody stopping and tell me about Jesus. I'd go sit on the beach and somebody interrupt me and tell me about Jesus. I mean, it happened constantly. And, and you know, and I've told the details of it, and I'm not going to go into all the details of it now. But I mean, it was just everywhere I went, everything I tried to do, I'd go sit on the beach in the middle of the night wanting to get away from everything, and somebody would stop start talking to me about Jesus. Constantly. Constantly. And that went on for a period of time. I mean, I left California. I'm getting out of here. <laughs> That's like, why? Well, but I did leave. And, and I came back to Illinois. <laughs> and still flying a heathen. But you know what began to happen? I can tell you the finest detailed accounts of some of those experiences I had where people witnessed to me. I can tell you what they said to me. I can tell me how they looked. I can tell you the food I ate while they were talking to me. I can tell you where I sat at that time. The, just etched into my memory. Those moments. And that seed was planted in my heart. Now, a lot of times people might get discouraged and say, you know what, I witnessed the 10 people, nothing happened. Some of those people who shared the gospel with me, who I was all cocky and argumentative with and act like I didn't care, they may have went and back to their, their church and said, you know, I've been doing that witness and stuff, and I went down in the sky on the beach, and, and I shared Jesus with them, and he just laughed at me and made fun of me. I ain't doing that no more. They don't work. They plant seeds. And you know what happened? The Holy Spirit kept bringing those up to me. And kept bringing those up to me. And kept bringing those up to me. And some people came along since then. And along the way, they wandered a little bit. And there were people praying for me. And the, the rain began to fall. The Holy Spirit began to fall. And one day, God gave the increase. But you see what, what, what you've got to understand here. Hear what I'm saying. Because I'm going to get the scriptures in a minute to illustrate this. They planted a seed in my heart. And the power to bring forth the fruit is in the seed that was planted. That is 100% biblical. The parable of the sower. The sower sows the seed. What brings forth the 30-fold, the 60-fold, and the 100-fold? The power of that is in the seed to bring forth the fruit. Right? Yes. The power is in the seed, by incorruptible seed, to be born again. Talks about the, the, the mustard seed that was planted, and, and the tree became giant, bigger than all others, and birds began to come land on it. How did that mustard seed grow? It was, it was in the DNA of that seed, was that tree, right? It was in there. There's a parable too in there, that about a man who plants a seed and he grows, and he don't even know how. The farmer puts a seed in the ground, and he don't know how, and one day, poof, increase comes. What am I saying, beloved? If you plant a seed, trust the seed and trust God and bring the increase. Those people never knew that it came to harvest time. Those people never knew there was a day in Illinois when I called out to God to save me. As a result of their seed being planted in me and me being watered, and one day God brought forth the increase, they never had no idea. They may have quit witnessing because it don't work. Just because you don't see it, I can remember when I was a kid, a little bunch in Virginia, and we were studying in school Johnny Appleseed. Remember him? Johnny Appleseed, this guy supposedly walked across the country and planted apple trees. <coughs> you guys don't know who, nobody hits 
Johnny Appleseed. Come on, help me out here. You did see that? <laughs> did you go to that school in Mexico? <coughs> <laughs> And yeah, the right name. Jose Uh And there's that John Appleseed. So for a class project, we all got to plant a tree. And I planted the tree, and I remember very specifically that dad planted the tree. Now, time later, we left and we moved away. And I never did see that tree. You realize how big that tree might be now? Oh my goodness, that long ago? Uh, it's been a long time now. That tree may be a monster. <coughs> I mean, it may be huge. I didn't have to be there. The power was in the little tree thing, the seedling thing that I planted. It was already there for that to become a huge tree. And I'm sure that they, they, they got water. <coughs> God brought forth an increase. I didn't even see that. You see, you may have shared the gospel to multitudes of people at times, and you have no idea the fruit that may be coming forth right now today as a result of somebody you shared Christ with somewhere in the past. One man plants, another man waters. But God gives the increase. God gives the increase. And let me share something with you. When you plant those seeds, trust me, God is watching over those seeds. God watched over that tree, I believe. He watched over it. Made sure it got water. Made sure it grew. Made sure the sun shined on it. Made sure the wind blew and all the stuff it needs to develop and grow. God brought food and increase. I just planted a little, whatever they, what they call seedlings or whatever they call them. God brings forth the increase. You with me so far? Okay, Joshua chapter 3. We all forgot all about that. I told you we were going to go there. I hear it's been really applied there to what I've been sharing with you about the move of God. The Israelites are being led by Joshua and prepared for battle. And they have a message here of something they have to do. And quite often, who brings the increase? Now God does, doesn't he? God brings the increase. Now, God's going to give them the victory. Right? God's going to bring forth the increase. He's promised them this land. As long as they walk in what his word says, as long as they walk with him, walk in his truth, God is going to bring the increase, or God is going to put it in more common terms. God is going to bring the manifestation of the promise. <coughs> that would be a good definition of increase, wouldn't it? Increase would be the manifestation of the promises of God in our life. If, I, if I'm going to... Using money, for example, if I'm going to pay a tithe and plant seed and God's going to bring an increase, that means there's going to be a manifestation of money. If I'm going to put the Word of God and the healing promises in my heart and I'm going to believe God for healing, increase would be a manifestation of healing. Whatever we apply it to, increase would be manifestation. I'm talking about a move of God I'm seeing in my spirit. Increase, when, manifest, when increase comes, that's a manifestation of what God is birthing in me and showing me. Right? So he's talking to these people here through Joshua and telling them that they're getting ready to march into battle and say, there's something you need to do. And I'm going to show you something here that you may see it in a completely different way than you've ever seen it before. Joshua chapter 3. Y'all with me? Everybody's waiting for first, ready for that. Mm -hmm. Joshua chapter 3, verse 5. <coughs> and Joshua said unto the people, Sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. God is getting ready to bring increase, is what Joshua is saying here. Tomorrow is increase Sunday. You need to be ready for it, and you need to sanctify yourself. Now, why in the world would I have to sanctify myself? This used to throw me 
why would I have to sanctify myself to see God's wonders? Think about it. I mean, I don't earn things from God by sanctifying, do I? I don't earn things from God by setting myself apart. And the word sanctify there means basically set apart for God's use, set apart for God's purposes. What I always use for an easy, understandable definition of sanctify or sanctification is a sanctuary. In other words, it's something that is set apart solely for the use and purpose of God. So to sanctify ourselves is to separate ourselves from things solely for the purpose and the use of God. Think about this for a second. Why would I have to sanctify myself, and I'm not speaking to me in a personal way about this, about setting myself apart and sanctifying myself in the way of seeking God with all of my heart in a way like never before. God is speaking to me about leading the church into that place. Why would God have us to do that before we saw increase? Because he's telling us to get rid of the things in our life that hinder him from bringing forth increase into our life. Why would God speak to a church and try to lead a church to a place where they would sanctify themselves and set themselves apart and seek Him and begin to show in us in our spirit a move of God is coming as a result of that because what He's doing, He's saying there's things in your life, there's things in the church, not necessarily bad things, not necessarily sinful things, but things that are hindering me from bringing forth increase. I need you to lay them down and seek me with all of your heart so I can bring that increase into your life because He's the God of increase. There are things in our life that will stop us from seeing God's interest. Y'all sit on the edge of the chairs. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 12. Hallelujah. Seven pounds is not very heavy, is it? 
You wouldn't believe how heavy that is after a 15 mile march. Carrying that thing like this for 15 miles. By the time you get to the end of that 15 mile march, that thing weighs like a thousand pounds. And that little pack on your back, there ain't hardly nothing in, weighs a gazillion pounds. That canteen full of water that was half empty now, it weighs a gazillion pounds too. And those light things that you're carrying seem so heavy. And it begins to really hinder you. And it begins to hinder your, your, your ability to keep moving. And we can have weights in our life that don't seem like that big of a deal. And beloved, the next thing we know, that little weight, after a little bit of time, is so heavy. You see, beloved, there's stuff we probably need to lay down. Because to allow God to bring increase into our life. You see, that's something the rich man Wilbur didn't understand. God was trying to bring increase into his life. You remember the rich young boy, the one that came to Jesus and, you know, kind of patted himself on the back and took his arm, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus went through some things about the commandments. He said, well, I've got that since I was a child. You know, Jesus was a lot more tactful. I was, I said, really? I don't believe you. He said, well, that's fine. If you want to be perfect, just go sell all your stuff and come follow me. And it says some big words there. It says, Jesus, I mean, the, the rich young ruler went away greatly sorrowful. Why? Because he realized that his riches had a grip of hold of his heart that he couldn't let go of. And it broke his heart. Because here he was, he thought he was this mighty man of God, and Jesus just nailed us down. He <coughs> said, that's fine. You're, you're all this righteousness, you're this mighty man of God, lay down your money, come follow me. See, Jesus wasn't trying to take money from him. He goes on to tell Peter that, you know, that he would have been blessed hundredfold. God was trying to, I mean, which would you rather have? If I gave you a choice, would you rather have that man's riches or the kingdom? So Jesus was trying to bring increase into his life. He was trying to make a deal with him. I'll trade you the kingdom of God for your earthly riches if you'll just let go of them. I'll give you a move of God like you've never seen in your life if you will let go of some things and seek me with all my heart. If you lay down those things that hinder and weigh you down. I'll give you a little God. <clears throat> See, Paul understood that. Paul, toward the end of his life, was still saying, Lord, I'll give you everything. I'll count it as dumb that I might know you greater than I know you today. Have we gotten so going through the motionized, religious eyes, the proper word, Insti church institutionalized, that we're willing to settle for where we're at in the things of God? You know, people do that in prisons. <coughs> they get to where prisons. <coughs> That's where their friends are. That's where their family is. That's their home. That's the daily routine they understand. <clears throat> Do we get content with church as it is when God is saying there's so much more? And I always wonder that people pray for revival, people cry out for revival, people say, oh, praise God, I want to see a revival. But are we willing to lay down the, the weights that we need to lay down to see it? Are we willing to lay down the things in our life, those little things that hinder us? Are we willing to, to, to stop allowing the flesh to dictate our lives and truly follow the Holy Spirit? Are we willing to give up our daily comfort? God says, if you 
there's a limit of God that we can't imagine if we don't seek Him with all of our heart. And the way I understand it, to seek God with all of your heart, that implies laying stuff down and changing lives. It's just not words. It's okay, guys. Don't look so heavy. Sometimes I feel bad when I preach like this. It's like, oh God, why am I not doing this? Say, God, it don't matter anymore. I want to be here. You see, seeking God is not going to church. I mean, that's part of it, don't get me wrong. But we can go to church all the time, every service, service after service after service after service after service after service, after service and not truly be seeking God with all of our hearts. <coughs> Thank you. 